Good afternoon. I'm Ilsa Connect, and I'm the Deputy Director of Public Policy for the National Center for Victims of Crime. I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Working Cold Cases 101, Two Case Studies. And I apologize for our delay in getting started. We had a little technical issue that we seem to have um, fixed, so we will be um, proceeding from here. While our final participants are logging on, I want to just go over a couple of um, kind of housekeeping issues for those of you who have not been on a, a WebEx webinar before. Okay, this is um, about audio. It should be streaming over your computer speakers. Um, and if you're not hearing it, of course, you're not hearing me say this, but um, turn on or adjust your speakers. You can also dial into the web uh, teleconference if you like to, but it is coming over your computer speakers. So you may just have to adjust your, your volume if you're not hearing us right now. Um, I want everyone to know uh, if you have technical problems, uh, you can you can chat to us about it, but you also might want to try to call WebEx support at 866-229-3239. And uh, just to know, note that everybody on the webinar today, we have muted everybody upon entry to the call, so you will only be able to ask a question using the question and answer tool. Um, I'm going to show you where that is. If you are in a split screen view, you may see it as uh, a panel on the right side of your screen. You'll see it says Q&A. If you click on that uh, little arrow next to the Q&A, you will um, maximize that toolbar. It may also show up as a floating toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen. There's a question mark icon. Uh, you can click on that and it opens the, the question and answer panel for you. Type a question in the small box at the bottom of that panel and hit send. I just want everyone to know that those questions are only seen by uh, the panelists and by myself, the host, and not by other attendees. So we're going to do our best to answer questions at the end of the webinar today. We got started a little late, so we may not get to everyone's question today, but uh, we will follow up with you by email afterwards if we don't get to your question. Okay, we are um, very pleased to bring you this webinar today with the support of Applied Biosystems Life Technologies. Um, that's a DNA technology company that has been supporting our work to increase knowledge of um, how DNA technology can be used to assist criminal investigations, and they've been supporting all of our webinars. Um, and this is our sixth webinar this year, and the previous webinars are recorded and available on our website. We're going to be back next year with more webinars, one on using DNA and trafficking cases, um, more about crime scene evidence collection, and uh, probably one about local databases. So I want to tell you a little bit about the National Center for Victims of Crime before I turn our uh, webinar over to our presenter today. The National Center's mission is to forge a national commitment to help victims of crime rebuild their lives. And we do this through direct support to all victims of crime through our National Crime Victim Helpline, 1-800-FYI-CALL. We also provide training and technical assistance to those who work and interact with victims of crime, and we work with Congress to secure funding for victim services programs and uh, many times law enforcement related grants as well. We do a lot of work on the DNA backlog uh, and the Debbie Smith um, grant uh, funding. Maximizing the use of DNA technology is very important to victims, and that's why we've been doing this work for several years now. So since about 2002, the National Center has been in focus, um, focused on increasing understanding about forensic DNA and DNA technology because we do know that we can solve more crimes and prevent more crimes by making sure that we increase the use of DNA and DNA databases. Our DNA-related work um, not only includes webinars but in-person trainings. We have one coming up in Las Vegas in early February. We host a listserv for those who are interested in DNA-related issues, and we have developed materials about DNA uh, for victims and professionals who work with victims. All of those um, training announcements, webinars, uh, lists, the materials are all on our website, and this is the web address for our online DNA Resource Center. And this is my contact information. If you'd like more information um, about what we have available to you as far as uh, materials related to forensic DNA or you want to um, join our listserv, you can email me at this uh, email or you can call me. Um, 
I wanted to say we have about 100 and, almost 150 people on the call right now. And I'm really excited today about our speaker. We're going to get going with our with our speaker. His name is Mike Huff, Sergeant Mike Huff. He is a 35-year veteran of the Tulsa Police Department and has 31 years of experience as a homicide investigator and supervisor. He has investigated notable homicide and cold cases featured on 60 Minutes, 48 Hours, Cold Case Files, Forensic Files, and other national programs. He is an instructor in homicide investigation, cold case investigation, use of force investigations, and interview interrogation in Oklahoma and across the United States. So I want to thank Mike very much for being with us today. And I know, um, Mike, that your daily work is very, very busy. So I definitely appreciate your time. And I am going to uh, give the floor over to Mike now. OK, this is Mike Huff, and I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm not totally the reason for the technical uh, difficulty, but I'm certain I contributed to it. So uh, sorry f to waste your valuable time. But hey, we've got uh, a couple things we want to talk about today, and we're going to highlight a, a cold case that happened in 1975, just a couple weeks after this murder happened, a couple weeks, weeks after I joined the police department. And uh, we're going to talk about that and how that evolved into this cold case organization. But to to kind of start this off, uh, you know, I always like this quote, I can discover facts, Watson, but I cannot change them. And that's from Sherlock Holmes. And that's really what we're, we're about, um, you know, is to discovering facts. And uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, not just the cold cases that uh, carry a statistic as a murder that we're dealing with, but the missing people. And, uh, you know, the fact that these missing are um, are not a real murder statistic yet, but we all know that they are murders, and uh, it's very frustrating in dealing with them. And there are some resources that that I think we should uh, we should recognize. One being this wonderful NamUs database that we all sat around and and dreamed over the years that uh, something uh, something like this would would be available, and now it is. So here in Tulsa, these are just a few of our uh, are missing people that we have active investigations going on, and uh, as you do in your jurisdictions, and uh, we're we struggle with them sometimes, and and you know we'll share our successes if if people are interested in that also. Uh, you know this is a missing person problem nationwide. Uh, at any one time, there's a hundred thousand missing people. Um, that fluctuates, and there are 40,000 unidentified uh, dead laying around in different uh, uh, morgues and stuff across the country. Here in Oklahoma, we have started a, uh, a situation with Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation to get those uh, missing remains entered into the University of North Texas, uh, and so we can uh, have those remains entered, and hopefully the, the long-term missing people, family members or survivors will provide DNA buckle swabs so we can also enter those and, and match those up. Here's just, you know, kind of some of these things that we deal with as an industry and, and uh, we need to help our medical examiners through this problem also because at the end of the road there's uh, some uh, real success stories and uh, bringing some relief to family. I hate to use the word closure, but uh, uh, there, there is some resolution to their, their problem, and uh, one of the, one of the cases that's really driving on a national level to maybe get us as law enforcement some more resources is uh, the missing person uh, Billy Smolensky, out of Connecticut. Um, his, uh, his family, his mother and father, have carried this. Uh, um, problem of a lack of resources for uh, law enforcement uh, to a national level and uh, uh, it has kicked around in um, in the Senate uh, some national funding to help us but there uh, there is a problem uh, with money in the United States so uh, you know we don't have a whole lot of hope that that's uh, going to have a quick resolution. Right here in Tulsa, we have a situation uh, that I want to share a, uh, a family member's um, 
comments uh, with you. And uh, Miss Charlotte Callis, uh, his daughter was uh, in South Florida, and uh, her daughter was uh, Ashley Malton, Malden. And in 2006, Ashley um, is believed to have been murdered and and uh, put in in uh, literally international waters, probably by her husband, and uh, who overinsured her for a couple million dollars and. Uh, um Ms. Callis ran into the jurisdictional problem between uh, what county, if it was the state of uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the FBI, the Coast Guard, she got bounced around. And it took her three years to uh, get her daughter's DNA entered into CODIS, which is just uh, uh, a, a tragic event right there. Uh, she recognizes the, the problems uh, that us as law enforcement have, and uh, she is, uh, has pledged her assistance to, to help out uh, this International Association of Cold Case Investigators, which I'm going to talk about later and, and hopefully get some of your interest in that also. Um, here we are in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, not very many people uh, really know what we look like out here, but... Uh, uh, it's a cosmopolitan city. It's not cowboys and Indians, although it might be simpler if it was. But uh, uh, just give you a couple of views. It's a, it's a it's a pretty town, of course, and and we we are um, stuck with the problems of any other major city of uh, murders and and a rising crime rate and struggling with what to do with these cold cases and the demands on uh, law enforcement as as a industry. Taking a look back to 1975, this was uh, the year that I joined the police department here in Tulsa, and um, Tulsa was, was a relatively sleepy city, and we uh, um, we had uh, you know our our share of crime, but nothing extraordinarily uh, challenging, if you will. Um, but we we realized when when Geraldine Martin, who was a a, a young um, student at uh, a community college here, and she worked for a, a lawyer's office. We realized when she turned up missing from from the uh, downtown campus of Tulsa Junior College that uh, uh, we had some sort of problem, and uh, uh, there was a real fear of foul play, and and a massive effort went on uh, with the the police department to try to. Um, to work that missing persons case for a couple of weeks that it uh, that it lingered and everybody knew that uh, uh, this was going to have a tragic ending and and this was indeed the, the tragic ending and it's it's a familiar sight that uh, we uh, see in law enforcement um, you know it, it's one that uh, um, places a, a huge responsibility and burden on a police department to conduct a investigation in regards to uh, that. And as as far as, uh, you know, a young uh, victim, a female, it, it, she had every reason to live. She wasn't in a, uh, in a lifestyle that put her at risk. And uh, I think these are the things that drive the news media to, to, uh, make us respond and make us uh, uh, really go out all out on any investigation. So in the early days of this investigation, uh, we, we had found her at this uh, uh, abandoned uh, uh, public housing project, or actually that was going through a remodel, and, and she had been uh, uh, raped and strangled, as you can see in this, the ligature marks. Uh, it was obvious uh, a, a sexual assault, so you know you get in that mode of in investigation there, and um, you know we worked the scene as best as we could in 1975. Uh, of course, DNA wasn't even a thought, and uh, you know the detectives that worked the scene um, and gathered evidence. Um, gathered everything and as a cold case investigator now you look back on on that and you have that paradigm shift of you know what is 
available now compared to then. So uh, we worked that case pretty um, uh, pretty thoroughly at the time. Uh, this is a composite drawing of a, uh, a suspect that was observed trying to use some of her uh, credit cards at a, uh, a department store. And uh, this was uh, the best we had at the time, identikit. And uh, so you kind of see historically how law enforcement has progressed through through the years in the you know 30 year process. Um, here, right here, just a little little preview. Clyde Carl Wilkerson um, is going to be the suspect, and uh, you see that there is a, compa uh, a comparison. There is a uh, you know a bit of similarities here. We're kind of on the money. Uh, but this could look like, uh, you know, many people. Now, as, taking a step forward uh, in this, uh, going about 30 years, I certainly want to give some, uh, uh, not some credit, really all the credit to Detective Bob Anderson, who was at that time with the El Cajon California Police Department, uh, working several other cold cases. And uh, you see these buttons here, that uh, these little uh, pin map. Uh, this guy killed a bunch of people, and uh, over a 37-year time period, and we really still think that he has ki uh, he's killed more, uh, and we're we're looking into that uh, as really as a cold case organization and as uh, networking from from uh, detective to detective. So, um, give you a little bit of brief history here. Uh, Detective Anderson uh, in Southern California was working a series of first-degree burglary um, uh, murders, and uh, he developed a suspect, being Clyde Carl Wilkerson, and Wilkerson was an over-the-road truck driver for a long period of time, so he put together a timeline of well, where Wilkerson um, had uh, had lived over the years, and um, he, he made his cases through a DNA comparison in California, but he felt that Wilkerson had um, had committed other crimes. So he got on the Internet, and we all know and love the possibilities that the Internet has given us, but looking for information on it really is, is still in its most basic stages. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And uh, but Detective Anderson w really was uh, extraordinary in his um, in his quest to find this guy. So he reached out and, and looked on the internet to see if uh, locations where this guy had lived um, had uh, a website, and it mentioned their cold cases. So. Uh, very fortunately, w this was in in the year 2001, I believe, and um, we had uh, understood the power of the internet here in Tulsa, of course, as we all do. Is uh, but we had put our cold cases out there on the internet in in hopes of not just generating some uh, public interest in it, but actually generating good solid leads. And uh, I liken that to uh, fishing with a trot line for all you fishermen out there. You know, you get as many hooks in the water um, and you hope that you get nibbles and bites. And uh, we got a huge bite when Detective Anderson found the Tulsa website and uh, called us. And I can remember the Friday afternoon that he, he got a hold of us and said, hey, I think that uh, we've got a suspect for you in your uh, Geraldine Martin case. And uh, this particular case was kind of Tulsa's end of innocence. It, it was a case that uh, we all looked back to as uh, this is the beginning of Tulsa becoming a big town because we really felt that it was a serial killer that had uh, uh, taken the life of Geraldine Martin. So um, he shared with us his information on Wilkerson. and. And this period in 2001 was before the advances of of, of CODIS, and uh, now this uh, thing is 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 automated. Uh, but uh, going back to the the abilities and and drive of Detective Anderson, it was just uh, extraordinary that he 
uh, put this thing forward and and really sought out other people's cases and uh, so that afternoon we uh, we got the DNA uh, uh, techies on the phone from this end and, and they're in in California and by the end of the day we had um, you know solved the case of Geraldine Martin so that was an extraordinary day and uh, uh, absolutely with the uh, uh, gratitude to uh, Detective Anderson out there in California uh, we started looking back over this case and it was a, really a lesson to us uh, as to what we need to do in, in law enforcement in, in working a cold case, how we could have possibly developed a suspect uh, at that uh, time, or, or really how, you know, we're, we're in a time where it's a, it's a real paradigm shift. We're going into this DNA and, and uh, the CODIS and uh, information technology and Internet, uh, you know, usage as well as um, sex offender registration, things that uh, we just didn't have back then, but now we can look at it. And really, I think as we look forward in the future, we'll see um, the benefits of this even more because it will have had time to kind of uh, solidify and give us a, a, a pool of people uh, in DNA pools in CODIS that we can work more cases. So we, we look at this map here. And we see right here in red where it says 1129 North Osage. Uh, this is the location where Geraldine Martin was found. And we see just really right next to it, 1127 North Denver. This is the location where Clyde Carl Wilkerson was living at the time. So I think that gives us a, a you know an idea in our own mind that you know a lot of times uh, serial criminals will will work in a comfort zone. We see here where it says TJC, that's where the actual abduction occurred. So we're within a mile or so, and I think statistics of uh, research will show a lot of times that you're going to have an abduction location and a body dump site that is uh, uh, going to be fairly near. I think they can actually give some statistical research that shows that it's within uh, a mile or two. So. Uh, it's it's not the kind of thing where somebody is driving a body in the trunk 50 miles out into the country and doing it, although that does happen. Uh, but we we see here uh, also where the uh, purses and uh, checks were found, uh, different locations where the um, where Geraldine Martin worked, as well as the two locations where her credit cards were used. So. Uh, you know, this this is the kind of information that we gather and we plot on a map for, uh, say, the behavioral science unit uh, with the FBI to uh, to look at and then uh, not only help us with our case, but to really fuel that research so they can give us some some uh, uh, investigative direction or strategies uh, for the future. And I think that we should all look. Uh, to uh, some of these um, resources that we have now and, and look at that and see if that is something that we can we can use so going through again this is where Geraldine's body was found Clyde Wilkerson lived here and I think we should have covered that in a canvas uh, it gives you you know the idea today that as we're working a brand new murder today Let's look at these old murders and realize that, yeah, the suspect did live just a, a block or two away. Uh, let's really spread that canvas out and let's go back and knock on those doors till we get everybody's name. And then with information technology, we can check everybody's name, again, sex offender registrations and things like that. And I am absolutely preaching to the choir here. I know that all of you know that, but I have to remind myself of, of these basic things, every case that we work, and uh, I think that we we find ourselves with some answers and solutions if we just make certain that we go through the basic investigative steps. Here's a newspaper article that showed Clyde Wilkerson in 2002 and linking him to this 1975 
rape and murder here in Tulsa. Um, and uh, also that he is uh, charged with killing two people out in California in 1965. So I, I can tell you from experience over and over again that, um, you know, it's not like chasing, the, uh, you know, a suspect out the back door in the middle of the night and being able to run him down and have all that success. But it's really exciting when you can grab an old man and say, hey, look, uh, remember Tulsa in 1975? You know, we're putting your butt in jail, and uh, and to to see that that we finally brought some some resolution to that case. Uh, uh, taking a step back at that, uh, not only is it great to be able to um, to arrest somebody and and uh, let them know that hey, dude, you didn't get away with this deal. It's also great to be able to go to those families, and uh, we we were fortunate to still have Geraldine Martin's father alive. He lived out of state, and uh, he had struggled every day for his entire life from 1975 till, till uh, the time in 2002 when we, uh, when we made that arrest uh, with uh, trying to understand what happened to his daughter. Uh, obviously, his life was just in shambles for the rest of it. And we went to to his bedside where he was literally on his deathbed and, and gave him the news as to to what happened to his daughter. And, uh, uh, you know, what a, um, a satisfying time there. I mean, it really it fuels our fire in law enforcement as, you know, hey, this is why we do this job and this is, uh, this is who we do it for. And, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, literally weeks, uh, uh, Geraldine Martin's father passed away, but he did that with knowing what, what happened to his daughter. We look back here from 1965 on the left when, uh, you know, Clyde Wilkerson was uh, was working these, uh, you know, deals and, and did his murders that spanned really from the time he started them to the time he got caught, 37 years. So, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to be able to find these pictures and see how these people progress. I, I think that's something that um, a jury likes to see, uh, you know, how these people progressed over the years. And, and it's it's definitely a learning experience uh, for us in law enforcement. And um, I think that, you know, you, you can really break this down into the minutia that we investigate and and learn from it. You know that that was the Geraldine Martin case, and that really got us thinking um, here in Tulsa. And uh, I'm fortunate to travel all over the country and 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 have met uh, detectives, uh, you know, literally from around the world. And there's some wonderfully smart people uh, that uh, um, contribute so much to investigations and and death investigations. So. Uh, but one thing that we realized is that um, really about 40% of, of homicides are not solved. And uh, uh, that's before you even get into these missing persons cases that uh, aren't even listed as a homicide, homicide statistic. And, and, and as an industry, we need to sit back and say, uh, you know, what the heck is going on because we have – uh, all of these new day industries. Uh, I mean, uh, we have DNA. Uh, we have, uh, uh, of course, we have CODIS, NamUs. We have uh, NIBINS for ballistics information. We have APHIS for fingerprint information. Um, we have advanced technologies for, uh, you know, trace evidence and things of this nature. And uh, but yet we are still. Uh, missing about 40% of, of the murders and closing murders. So I think that uh, we we really um, need to be concerned with that. And um, I think one of the things that we realized uh, in being concerned about that is that uh, there should be a simple uh, or a simpler solution to this. We need to figure out to, uh, how to rally around a case, uh, how, how to rally around each other as uh, investigators and provide uh, assistance and communicate with each other 
and really learn what resources are available. And uh, you know, this this quote by Einstein: "Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler." And uh, you know, this is a this is a quote which pretty much says it all. We we need to uh, be able to understand the technologies uh, that that we have available, uh, but not oversimplify them. And uh, problems cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. Uh, that's uh, you know, we're not making this better by doing the same thing over and over again. And that's the next quote: "Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result." So. You know, we got thinking about this uh, thanks to uh, Bob Anderson with California and uh, Clyde Carl Wilkerson and, and the success of the Geraldine Martin case. And and so, you know, this is what really came about from, um, you know, really two or three, four years of uh, beer drinking and margarita drinking, if you if you will. Uh, you know, most every uh, problem on a uh, unsolved case can be solved with some form of alcoholic beverage. I uh, hope you don't take offense to that. But, um, you know, we we found that um, there were a lot of resources out here that, that were really uh, just free, and people are, are bending over backwards, backwards to help us. Uh, NamUs, uh, uh, you know, Todd Matthews uh, was the inspiration behind NamUs with the Doe Network. What a wonderful young man uh, he is. Uh, what a solution that he he has um, developed uh, with the help of many, many smart people. Uh, University of North Texas, if you have not met, met those people um, from uh, UNT, uh, they are wonderful in providing a resource for Center for Human Identification. They will take your your unidentified remains and will take your survivor samples uh, uh, for missing people, and they will plug them into a system. And you know, I can guarantee you, they will bend over backwards to make your life uh, easier. They give you a resource. Uh, again, National Institute of Justice is there are tons of resources available. Uh, through the University of North Texas, um, and and we see this is from uh, Dr. Eisenberg down at UNT. The number of missing represents our country's silent mass disaster. I mean, these things are are for us as the first line of contact with these survivors and these these murder cases. Um, these are the resources that you you pull. So. Uh, this is a picture of Todd Matthews. Uh, he spent 10 years trying to determine one body's identity, and he's not even associated with law enforcement. Um, but he uh, he did that, and from that, he had a 10-year trial and tribulation um, to understand the uh, the problem. Uh, CODIS, again, another one of our uh, wonderful uh, resources, and I think that if you get the opportunity for those of you out west, and, and I hope that Rock Harmon, uh, who is a retired prosecutor from California, uh, for you folks out west in the, uh, in February, we're going to be out there in Las Vegas, and I hope Rock Harmon gets to talk about familial DNA searching, uh, which is a, a method to not only go into CODIS and find um, the suspect, but you find people that may be closely related to the suspect to generate your investigative leads. California has modified their DNA laws, if you will, to allow that, and there's an exciting case that uh, is just being solved and prosecuted out there with the Grim Sleeper is the nickname they have given this, uh, this turd that uh, was killing people over a period of time out there. And Rock Harmon is a huge proponent of it, and uh, uh, especially for uh, uh, you people out in Las Vegas and, and prosecutors that want to hear really aggressive uh, prosecution uh, theory, uh, these are, are some of the uh, resources that you get from uh, University of North Texas. Uh, you see that. Um, you know, we, we've got and I, I, we just put this up here just uh, I'll give me a minute to, to talk about this, but um, 
actually I'm going to scoot back to uh, and talk about the Cole case before we get to that. Uh, but a as we realized, um, really from around uh, the world, we you know, were sitting down with some people from Scotland Yard. We were sitting down with people from the RCMP and, and just, uh, you know, normal detectives uh, everywhere from small departments to large ones and uh, found that we had a collection of really, really smart people. And so from those conversations that lasted uh, for uh, a couple of years, um, we we thought, you know what? We need to have some sort of organization that supports this really unique um, problem that we have with cold cases and missing people. And um, every organization I've ever been a part of that is consists only of of uh, law enforcement, it's really a narrow sliver of the problem. And we really wanted to kind of be inclusive to to other um, to other entities and, and uh, professions. And so we included not only uh, law enforcement, but prosecutors, forensic professionals. Uh, the news media does a, does a job, or the media, if you will, does a job that getting these cold case things out. They use it for entertainment. We use it for resources. Uh, the corrections industry, there's, you know, uh, millions sitting in prisons everywhere that know about murders. How do we get that information out? Uh, as well as higher education that, uh, you know, can research or be uh, a, another resource to us as uh, law enforcement or prosecution, as well as survivors, um, people that have the energy and, and want to do something constructive uh, with their energy to make certain other people don't uh, – don't go through what they've gone through. I think those are the people that can drive uh, the lawmakers into uh, productive uh, laws that help us collect DNA from people that are arrested, not just convicted, uh, and, and uh, provide resources and funding for different uh, endeavors that we as law enforcement are, are involved in. And, you know, if you put them all under one, uh, one umbrella, if you will, and uh, then you come up with the fact that this is an organization that's inclusive, and it's an organization that really doesn't care just about your membership fees. It's an organization that wants good people, smart people to be involved as owners of the organization, having not just membership but ownership, and collectively we can push this ball downfield and um, and make some progress. And we can network with people overseas that have wonderful new uh, technology advances uh, that uh, uh, they see things differently. Maybe Scotland Yard, uh, United Kingdom may be more investigative oriented than we're we're in in the United States enforcement oriented and there's things like that. So we just wanted to be a, uh, an umbrella organization that puts our arm around all the resources and individually helps people solve their problems. So we hope that um, we can generate more interest. We've got a tremendous amount of interest. Uh, we didn't realize how, how big it was to um, try to build an international organization um, while I'm still working full time, while but now some, we've, we're getting the help that uh, is uh, uh, leading us towards funding, so we can um, be a resource. The, the organization itself has said that they're not going to accept one person's um, money for membership before we can provide a service that is really of value to to the potential members. Um, my partner on this uh, always put uh, this, this deliverance thing uh, in there because uh, right at the very end of the deliverance, and this this is uh, – I, I don't think the animation is here. I think I'm, I might have froze up the screen, Nilsa. Um, but w we want to be the, uh, the killer's worst nightmare, and that's what we want to try to help you be, and it's so exciting to be – that if you remember the last uh the last bit of uh, uh of 
deliverance is when the hand comes out of the water and the suspect who thinks he's got away with murder jumps up in bed and and uh, that's his worst nightmare. So so we're using this to, as a call to action to you guys and gals and uh, we we want to see you involved. We want to benefit from your knowledge and energy ourselves because uh, we all have open cases that I would love for somebody else to solve for us. Um, and, and so we're we're just trying to put out a call to action. You know, you'd go back to your agency and figure out what you can do to uh, for missing people, people cases to uh, locate all your cold cases. Uh, obtain family reference samples on these uh, uh, missing people cases, submit that to be uploaded to CODIS, uh, establish a solvability protocol for cold cases, and we have a very uh, good one that should be linked to our uh, cold case website, uh, or actually our temporary website as our, as our cold case work platform is being built. And uh, we want to... Um, we want you to participate in trainings, not just as students, but we'd love to hear your uh, your success stories and how your agency has solved problems. And, and that's what we're trying to do here. And uh, uh, here is uh, uh, my contact information. Uh, it's mhuff at cityoftulsa.org. My personal cell phone is 918-527-0075. Uh, my partner is uh, retired recently, and that his information is there also. But um, I appreciate you listening to uh, to me. I, I'm honored to be part of this webinar, and uh, I I really look for uh, some emails from folks to want to be involved, and uh, I will welcome that and. Uh, uh, we're so excited to tell this story, and it, it's a, a nationwide story. Everybody wants to be part of a solution, and we're just trying to to uh, give you a vehicle to do that. So, Ilsa, I, I think I'm at the end of the road and ready for a question or two if we have time. Okay, thanks so much. I want to just take a minute to apologize. Uh, Mike, you don't know this, but we had some audio difficulties during the webinar. It sounds like or it seems like everybody was eventually able to get into the teleconference and and um, most people seem to have stayed on the webinar so I'm assuming everybody sort of got sound at some point um, but just a reminder that we did record the webinar so it will be available on our website um, sometimes it takes me about a day to get that up on the website um, but that link will be there at www.ncvc.org slash DNA all of our other recorded webinars are there as well but thanks for your for your patience with that, um, we, I don't know, it's one of those days. We're just having strange uh, technical issues. So um, it looks like we have a couple of questions, but I think these are questions that might be best answered um, individually. They don't, uh, sort of more specific, uh, I think, for Mike. So um, I just want to thank everybody for their patience and for signing on today. And um, just remember to, to visit our website and learn about our future webinars. And um, oh, there's a couple of questions actually. It just popped up. Yes. Okay. The copy of the PowerPoint. I did mean to mention that, but I got distracted by the the other technical issues. We will put also a copy of um, the PowerPoint on the website. And then, if you want a certificate of attendance, give me an email, and I will send you one of those as well. Um, and let's take this one question. I've got one or two, actually, that are just popping up. Uh, Mike, for you, how was the DNA matched up on the sexual assault cases? Were sexual assault exams completed on the victims and matched to the perpetrator? Uh, in regards to the um, sexual assault of Geraldine Martin, uh, we had the DNA. Of course, this was pre-CODIS. Um, the, the DNA uh, scientists, uh, if you will, um, match the uh, the sample to the offender uh, initially over the phone and then, then did that uh, uh, through scientific methods. So uh, that's pretty much rocket science to me, but, uh, you know, we were the, the the beneficiary of that wonderful work. Okay. Awesome. Um, question, did Wilkerson ever, ever confess? No, Wilkerson never confessed. Uh, we, uh, we had a... Uh, 
another almost exactly similar case uh, that we found during that era when he was a truck driver in Indiana. Uh, we just discovered that case in uh, April of last year when we were uh, talking at a uh, at a forum in uh, Florida. Uh, that he's under investigation for that one and we believe that there are others so his 15 or so that he did are probably just a snapshot of, of what was going on with him okay um and then there was one more question related to that are there any similarities between all his victims uh, his uh, initial two that he did in 1960s uh they were first degree burglaries they wouldn't have they wouldn't have um been matched as, as a similar, and even if VICAP was a, you know, had been available uh, during that time, they wouldn't have hit. Um, you know, obviously, um, I think all but one or two of his murders were females. Um, the, you know, the, the strangulation uh, happened um, several times, but there wasn't a level of uh, interaction or or um, you know, involvement in the crime scene that would just really stand out there. Um, this guy was just, when he had an opportunity to kill somebody and think he'd get away with it, man, he did it. And the same person wanted to know, was he ever on the East Coast during that time frame that you uh, know of? W not that we know of. Okay. But um, one of our things is we're going to update the, the timeline, if you will. We've been trying to contact Bob Anderson, but he has since left El Cajon. So if anybody knows Bob Anderson, um, you know, we'd love to hear from him. <laughs> okay. Um, we have time for this. Well, one last question is, did he have a motive? Like, I don't know how you would necessarily know that, but um, do you know? You know, like many many uh, serial killers that are sexual-based serial killers, their motive is sexual gratification, however weird or, uh, you know, how we don't understand that is, is true uh, sexual gratification they do. So that that motive uh really ran through this it wasn't a motive to to really take that property or or use a credit cards or whatever it was really just uh, uh, you know based on his sexual gratification however sick he was okay um one more and then we're done is there dna sharing across national borders can you answer that question well you know that is a good question uh i don't think so at this time, uh, I think there's uh, some kind of portages that are trying to connect, but there's uh, there's huge issues, and uh, you really get into to um, you know international relationships there. Us as a cold case organization have been asked to come to the southern border uh, by uh, different entities to uh, assist in information sharing and border violence and really try to identify and address some of these things. And that's that's uh, potentially on our plate for 2011, and we would love to make contact with people that have some inroads there so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. And along that line, um, you might want to um, check out specifically the the web, or the webinar on our website that was um, called uh, Maximizing the Potential of DNA Technology. And that was um, Chris Asplund was the speaker, and he did a whole does a whole section um, on uh, sort of international issues. So I, I can't remember specifically. Um, it was a while ago. I can't remember specifically how much he covered that uh, DNA sharing across borders, but you might want to check that one out. Um, okay, so it looks like there's a bunch of questions coming in, but I'm going to suggest um, that people, um, if you have specific questions about cases, it looks like some are coming in that you email Mike directly. Um, we are going to sign off now since we started a little bit late. We're going to we're going to shut it off. And I just want to thank once again, Mike Sergeant Mike Huff. I know that your schedule is very busy, and I really appreciate it. So, thank you so much, and everyone have a great holiday season. And hopefully, we will see you on the next webinar. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.